Well, Massimo, good to see you again. Nice to see you. How are you doing? I'm good. I have to say, it's not really very satisfying communicating with you through print. Uh, I much <laughs> prefer it this way. <laughs> for, for the audience, they may not realize that Massimo and I wind up talking to each other a lot because I comment on his blog, uh, Player's right. Footnote, and so, uh, so we talk to each other sometimes in print, and um, it, I don't know. I, I like it better this way. Put it that way. There are a number of other irritants when, <laughs> when, when we're doing exchanges on the blog. That's right. There's a lot of other people, of course, some, some of whom get on some of people's nerves. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but I think in general, that's, that's an interesting observation because it, there is a difference for sure between commenting on a blog or on social networks or whatever it is and actually see somebody face to face. Yeah. Uh, even, even if you're not physically present in the same room, uh, it's a completely different kind of interaction. Of course, first of all, it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction in this case, as opposed to a many to many. But, but also there's something about the written word that you need, if you think about it carefully and you wanna, you, you write what you actually want to write and convey, uh, that might work. Uh, but if you just write comments on the fly, uh, yeah. it's not. Oh, wow. And also, you miss all the nonverbal cues, and so and so you it's ripe for misinterpretation or ascribing a motive that isn't there, or you know. And so, um, but it's the best we can do. Um, yep. So let's do the introduction. So I'm Dan Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University, and this is my partner. I'm Massimo Pilucci. I'm the KD Rani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. And this is Sophia. So, um, Massimo, today we're going to, after an epic journey through your latest book, um, we are today going to lighten things up a little bit. Um, and um, we're going to return and do another installment of something we've done once already, and that is um, philosophers who influenced us, uh, or who continue to influence us. And last time you chose Bertrand Russell and I chose Gilbert Ryle. Um, this time uh, you've chosen David Hume. And I've chosen uh, Arthur Danto. And so why don't we start with you and you can talk about why you chose Hume, what, what it is about Hume that's been particularly influential on you and the like, and, uh, and we'll go from there. I guess in, in my case, I'm kind of going in, in uh, chronological order because Sir Bertrand Russell was my very first philosopher. You know, he's, he's, I, I read his autobiography when I was like 15 or 16. And then I started reading a bunch of other things by him. Uh, so he was my sort of first love in philosophy. Hume is a more um, mature interest, let's say, and, and a more mature uh, kind of excitement. Uh, it came mostly uh, around the time that I was uh, deciding to switch career from biology to philosophy. So like, you know, 10 years ago, more give or, give or take. And the reason for that, I think there are a number of reasons for them, but, but for that, but one of them is that, that Hume was a very, very sharp thinker. He was the original skeptic in the, sen in the modern sense of the term, as opposed to sort of the Peronian sense of the term, right? So, although he did write a really nice essay about Peronian skepticism, actually, yeah, yeah. as it turned out. But he was a skeptic in the modern sense. Uh, um, and by that, I mean, uh, you know, people probably have heard uh, this um, sort of, uh, little phrase that was introduced a number of years ago by Carl Sagan uh, when he said that, uh, talking about pseudoscience, he, he said that uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And initially I met, you know, I, I've encountered that, that quote from Sagan, and I always thought it was Sagan uh, who came up with it, um, but that's only the modern rendition of something that actually Hume said, and Hume's version is, is much more interesting, much more nuanced. Uh, and it goes something on the lines of, uh, in, you know, uh, an educated person uh, uh, proportions his beliefs to the evidence, right? So it's not just the extraordinary claims that require evidence, extraordinary uh, evidence, it's just any claim requires, uh, it requires evidence. And, and the more evidence there is, the more you should lend credence to that, uh, to that um, claim. So once, once I started reading, he, Very interesting, very influential as a tradition. I found him very uh, nuanced. Very, you know, he was most famously probably highly influential on Kant, who uh, who said that uh, Hume had um, awoken him from his dogmatic slumber. And yeah. so we actually owe, owe uh, on part part of, of Kant's philosophy to a reaction to Hume. 
Um, but he also was, as it turns out, and, you know, then I read his biography, one of his biographies. I also read his very, very short autobiography. It's like a few pages. Uh, but his bio one of his biographies was made a big impact on me because he really um, uh, portrayed a, a thoughtful person who was also, however, a very nice guy. Uh, so he was, you know, when he when he spent time in France and he and he was um, very popular in the Enlightenment uh, salons in Paris, uh, they referred to him. The French referred to him as Le Bon David, you know, the the, the good David, the good yeah. humor David. Um, and um, so there's a number of reasons to like him, both in terms of as as a sharp thinker, as somebody who tried hard to work all his life on what he thought was really interesting and important. His you know his first book famously came out. Uh, and was almost completely ignored. Uh, he wrote it when I was very young, uh, you know, in what is in his early 20s. And in fact, he famously said that his, his first uh, baby, so to speak, fell, you know, dead still off the presses, you know. And then, but, but, but he wasn't discouraged. He went back, he said, okay, well, this is my fault. I could have, you know, I don't think it's the ideas that it's the problem. I think it's the way in which I explained it. So he came up with a couple of versions then later on and he, and he sort of rewrote the whole thing basically as what we we today call the inquiry into uh, human understanding so it it's it got a lot of things going for him both as a personal on a personal perspective and on uh, as a philosopher yeah the um the you're what you're referring to you're referring to the treatise of human nature which uh he published i think he was 26 years old right. and yeah. um it like you said was commercially unsuccessful and and um uh, he later revised it into two inquiries, the inquiry concerning human understanding and then the inquiry concerning the principles of morals. Um, I will say, however, that um, while the latter are stylistically far superior to the former, I think that there's a pretty strong consensus that they are intellectually inferior to the former. That is, they, are, they represent a significant simplification, even right. to the point of eliminating an entire section which was on the passions which yes. is crucial to understanding the morals. I mean, he sort of folds in some of the stuff from the passions into right. the inquiry. Um, but um, I, I got the impression that, that, that his main concern with the inquiries was to make it more accessible, not necessarily. Yeah. So in other words, it's not like the B version of Kant's critique of pure reason, which really was an attempt to improve the no. substance. Um, right, right. In the case of Hume, I think it was really only to make it more accessible because Hume really cared about being a good writer. He put a lot of stock on his essays for that reason. And he, and he was a good writer. I mean, you know, you read Hume and you really understand most of what he's saying, even though you, even though you may have a limited, uh, you know, background in philosophy. Try to do that with Kant, on the yeah, other impossible. hand. Impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, but you're right. The the later uh, the later versions were definitely uh, less philosophically sort of compelling or sophisticated or complete, uh, whatever whatever word one wants to use. Um, even though Hume himself actually repudiated basic his, 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 in writing in his autobiography, uh, his earlier version. But yeah. I think you're right. The consensus of, the, of scholars today is that the original version was actually philosophically more substantive. Uh, but it's interesting also to see how his thought evolved and how his style evolved. Yeah. And of course, he made a, eventually it was very it, it, it did become very successful not as a philosopher, but as an historian. That's right. That's his most famous. His most well well read work was the History of Britain. That's right. Yeah. Yes, it was a. It's it, it counts as more than a million words, so it's a it's a huge, uh, uh, you know, piece of writing. It was very accurate. Part of the reason he came up, it, it came about um, doing that sort of stuff is because he twice tried uh, to get an appointment as a philosopher at, at a, a university. I think first at Edinburgh and then at Glasgow. And in both cases, it was rejected uh, because it was considered an atheist, or at least a little, you know, his, his ideas on, on religion were a little too controversial for the time. In fact, yeah. at some point, it was even talked about uh, bringing him to trial. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, now, we're talking, you know, early 17th century. By that time, not very, you know, they were not very successful any, anymore because all you had to do was, for instance, to say that you were a member of the church and you, you were not even compelled to, uh, uh, to appear. But nonetheless, uh, you know, it was still a fairly dangerous time. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. It was not a, 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 a pleasant thing. And so eventually he found a job as a librarian at, uh, in, in Edinburgh. And, uh, and so that, as he says in his uh, autobiography, it didn't pay him much, but it, it gave him command that this gigantic library that he used um, to write the history of England 
uh, which was an instant success. And so I made him a bundle of money and it, it was very, he was basically comfortable for the rest of his life uh, on that. Later on, he was, um, I think he was asked to write an additional volume because the history starts with Julius Caesar's invasion of uh, Britain, and then it ends, I think, in the late 1600s. And he was asked to write another volume, and I think, I, I, don't, I don't have with me the exact words, but he, he answered something on the lines of, I am too old, too fat, and too comfortable. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the um, it's interesting also to, you know, I was thinking as you were saying this that, um, you know, we have a certain very strong picture today of philosophers as being sort of academics and sort of, and you know, I wonder if Hume was, was working in the 20th century, if he would have felt the same way about the treatise because, you know, you know, they, if, if your concern is purely academic, an intellectual, then the fact that it's not readable or isn't written stylistically in a pleasing way really doesn't matter. Um, right. But back then, they, those guys had ambitions to be, you know, to be to be good essayists, right? I mean, this goes back to Montaigne, right? Um, exactly. um, and um, and so I think that we can sometimes forget that their interests weren't solely intellectual, academic interests in the way that we think of a professional philosopher today, right? No, that's that's right. And in fact, that was not true just for philosophers. Um, it was also true for what later became known as scientists, because at the, at the time, the word scientist that actually did not exist. Yeah. It was introduced by William Buell in the late, early 19th century. But Darwin, for instance, uh, really tried, you know, later on, clearly wrote for a broader public. In fact, the first edition of The Origin of Species uh, sold out in a day or two or something like that. So, yeah, this was a time I would say up until the end of the 19th century, uh, where uh, for sure and possibly even uh, into, into part of the 20th century, uh, it was still a time where both scientists and especially philosophers were running for a broader public that were actually engaged. Um, and, uh, and they were actually had a much higher impact than, than almost any uh, you know, philosopher has to them. I mean, there are exceptions, you know, there are public philosophers like Peter Singer and Martha Nussbaum and, you know, people, people like that. Um, uh, they do have a significant impact actually in today's discourse. But at the time, I mean, for instance, let's take the, the case of the uh, famous uh, uh, discussion and, and sort of falling out between Hume and Rousseau. Yeah, yeah. This was news throughout Europe. This, this was, you know, uh, people were following this, 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 this right. thing. Now, now, no one could, now no one would give a shit, right? I mean, it's just like, exactly. right? oh, now, Dan and Massimo had a falling out. Oh, no, right? <laughs> oh, okay. Who cares, right? I'm saying, then who? Massimo, right. who? What? Right. <laughs> but, you know, even if it were Peter Singer having a big fallout with Martha Nussbaum. It wouldn't have that kind of impact. Exactly. But at the time, it was news throughout Europe. I mean, people were following this thing. So they, what happened was that they, uh, they, they uh, met each other in, uh, in, in France when, when Hume was in France. They became uh, sort of, if not friends, certainly good acquaintances. And, um, and actually, Hume tried at some point to help out Rousseau, offering him asylum, basically, in, yeah. in, in Britain, because Rousseau was into sort of political trouble, running pol political trouble. Uh, but Rousseau, who was quite, a, quite frankly, a paranoid prick, yeah. uh, eventually <laughs> sort of developed this, this um, uh, conviction that, that, that somehow Hume was sort of plotting behind his back and, and that he was betraying him and all that sort of stuff. And so he wrote a series of skating letters and, and Hume was taking it back. He's like, what the hell is going on? Right. <laughs> to the point, the thing that became so uh, sort of heated that at some point Hume actually felt the need to write a pamphlet to explain to the public what was going on, you know, what in, in the public, the, the pamphlet about, you know, the debate between Hume, uh, yeah. Mr. Hume and Rousseau. So it's not, again, something that's completely unthinkable of today. It's like, you know, seriously, what, what, who cares? Yeah, well, the, the, but intel the, the intellectuals then were celebrities uh, in a way that uh, today they're really not. I mean, with a very few, I mean, maybe someone like Sartre in the mid-century, you know, Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir yeah. maybe had that yes. kind of celebrity. But, you know, you can count them on one hand, right? I mean, the number of people that have had that sort of celebrity in the 20th uh, century. And, and even Sartre and de Beauvoir wouldn't have that today, probably, I'm, I'm betting. Oh, I agree with that, you, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. or in the 21st century, you know, if it is two rappers who have who are shooting at each other, then fine, then 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 it's you know, it's going to be headline viewers. <laughs> Maybe we need to start uh, shooting. I mean, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> so let me ask you, um, aside from the general appreciation that you have for his his sort of orientation and this idea that evidence should be proportionate, that what we claim should be proportionate to the evidence that we have, um, were there specific elements of Hume's philosophy that were particularly influential on you? Because there are a number of very strong elements to his philosophy that right. re resonated through the centuries, indeed, um, to the point to which, I mean, right. he was hugely influential in the 20th century on the logical positivists, right? And so I'm wondering That's if right. there are specific areas of his thought that were particularly influential on your uh, philosophy and the way your own philosophy formed. So on that one, uh, the answer is yes, but but, uh, but in, in that case, actually, my philosophy has developed over the years in some sense, um, uh, beginning to distance myself from Hume. Uh, I didn't quite have Kant's experience. I didn't work from my slumber or anything like that, but I was more sympathetic to a number of specific positions that Hume has uh, uh, a few years ago than I, than I am now. So one of the things that I do admire in him is essentially what I would call a naturalistic turn. Mm -hmm. That is, he really tried to uh, put philosophy in, uh, on naturalistic grounds. He, you know, he, of course, he wrote this famous essay on miracles where he basically you know, says don't, they don't exist or we, we don't have any reason to believe. In fact, that's the thing. He, he put it in terms of, you know, we don't have any reason. And people claim that there are these things out there, but we have no reason, uh, no sufficient evidence for it. Right. Uh, he also uh, published this dialogue on natural religion that, that includes one of the best arguments against intelligent design, you know, all, the, all that sort of stuff. On that one, I still, I'm still on board. Uh, he also can be seen as essentially a Bayesian thinker. Uh, Thomas Bias, the, the guy that invented Bayesian uh, probabilistic theory, uh, was actually alive at the time. And uh, we don't have any evidence that, that he and Hume corresponded. And besides, the Bias uh, paper was published when, after, after his death. Uh, but um, a number of scholars have reinterpreted uh, some of, of Hume's major arguments, especially the argument in, on miracles right. uh, uh, as a Bayesian uh, argument, right, as, as one of updating priors. As in, in proportion to the evidence and up, either updating them or uh, or downgrading them. So all of that, I'm on, I'm on board. Um, however, there is a number of things where I you know, started to disagree and see things in, in a little more complicated fashion. So let's take, for instance, uh, Hume's famous fork. Right. So there is there is a, 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 a nice phrase that he uses at some point when he says, you know, a very provocative phrase, uh, which is the one actually that connects him to logic positivism as you were saying about a little earlier and at some point he says basically you know consider what kind of books you're reading uh, i'm paraphrasing here this is not a direct quote but the, the original quote is worth checking out because it's beautifully written and he says you know so either they contain uh matters of fact so it basically they're either empirical empirical books you know so essentially what we will call science today or they are about relations of ideas uh which basically means logic and mathematics yeah. if they contain Either, as he said, basically all books on metaphysics and, and religion contain neither one of those. Then he said, con consign them to the flames because they contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. That's right. And that is it. Right. Now, I was struck when I first read this thing. I said, wow, the guy, first of all, he definitely had guts. You know, writing that kind of thing about yeah. theology. <laughs> right. At that time, that was, you know, he had guts. Um, and I'm also sympathetic to summing up to a point, meaning that what he was trying to do was to clear out the garbage, right? To clear out, and which is something that philosophers are still doing today, because yeah. there is you know, a certain degree of garbage, I think, without naming names, uh, in in, philo in philosophical discourse. And it's uh, or sometimes it's clever garbage. It's, it's what uh, Daniel Dennett famously refers to as a schmess, yeah. as, as a distinct to chess from yeah. chess, right? So it's the kind of mind if this kind of games, you know, hair splitting logic, that sort of stuff that philosophers are very good at, but they're not particularly useful. So I'm sympathetic to Hume's uh, so-called fork. But of course, the obvious uh, uh, response there is it about the same that was given several, you know, centuries, like a century and a half, two centuries later to the logical positivists, which is, 
uh, if you apply Hume's fork to Hume's own books, they're going to be burnt because they're not about empirical matters. They're not books of science as we recognize them today. And they're certainly not about relations of ideas. They're not books of logic or mathematics. Yeah. They're books of philosophy. Yeah. They're very good books of philosophy, yeah. right? So that to me means that in fact Hume's fork fails because there is a third option. I mean, we thought, as you said, we, we went through this painful exercise of doing three episodes on my, on my book, right, on my online book, on the nature of philosophy. But I, I do think that Hume was probably needed at the time. Because, you know, we, we also need to remember that thinkers ought, ought to be, uh, you know, uh, understood in the, in the context in which they were writing. Hume was still reacting to medieval philosophy. Okay. Yeah. He was still he was reacting to the to the uh, um, what he saw I think rightly uh, as as logic chopping that was coming out of you know medieval theologians and so to that kind of thing yeah I think I think Hume's fork really was a good re a good response but if we try to apply that to modern uh, discourses in philosophy as the the logical positivists were trying to do then I think we're going to run immediately into problems and the major problem is that there's a lot of very good philosophy, philosophical discourse that that I think do does does help in understanding, uh, and that philosophical discourse will fail Hume's fork test abysmally. Yeah, well, you know, let's um maybe this is worth just spending a minute on. I mean, I so I mean the positivists they take Hume over and they they turn his essentially epistemic point into a, a semantic point. That is, they say that. Right that statements that do not express either empirical propositions or what do they call analytic propositions uh, um, are literally meaningless. And of course, right. the problem is that that principle of verification is itself would then itself be meaningless on that view because it's neither an empirical statement nor a statement, an analytic statement. But in the case right. of Hume, I want to, I want to, I'm going to push a little bit. I'm wondering if Hume really does have that problem. And I'll, I'll, here's why. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that the treatise um, or the inquiries consists of a lot of synthetic a priori statements. In other words, statements of substantive statements that are not matters of fact. Um, what he does is he sort of exposes the limits of what can be rationally justified, after which he then says, the rest, all you can do is give a scientific explanation of what the thing is, of what it, of, of what it's. So, so you know, we can only justify our belief in cause and effect empirically, down to a certain point. After which, there are no more empirical justifications, and yet the phenomena has not been fully explained. He doesn't then go and speculate about it. What he right. then does instead is says, okay, at this point, all we can do is say why people think there's cause and effect. Um, but we can't demonstrate anything about it more beyond what's empirically verifiable, which is constant conjunction. And it seems to me that he does that across pretty much every topic that he's skeptical about. So is he really guilty in the way that the positivists obviously were of violating his own <laughs> principle? Right. No, no, no. So the, the positivists were definitely far more guilty than, than Hume. I think, I think, I mean, they took the, the worst part of that kind of approach and then run with, with it. Uh, and also, although to be fair, again, the positives themselves were reacting to a particular intellectual climate. Yes. And I think, I actually do think that philosophy is better off for having had the positive. I agree with that, to yeah. Put certain, you know, to, to set certain, certain targets that then were attacked and fairly, fairly well demolished by people like Putnam or Quine and you know, a bunch of others. I mean, it's unthinkable. You know, this is one one way in which, as you know, in my mind, philosophy does make progress. It's unthinkable to have a Quine, uh, you know, paper on 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 the dog, the two dogmas of empiricism without the positive. That's right. You know? That's so, right. So, so it's like, so this this is the kind of thing that you know one should never be sort of too presentist about things, meaning that oh, you know, and so dismissing what other people have done, you know, like a century ago or three or four or five. Uh, as, oh, look at those bubbling idiots, and we know so much better, because, you know, let's remember that in about a century, uh, we're going to be the bubbling yeah, idiots. So, yeah. um, you know, so, so I don't want to be too harsh on the, on the positives, but I do think that actually Hume was, in fact, more nuanced and, and less uh, um, 
sort of less ambitious in that sense. So I, I, to, to, a, to a degree, I do agree with you. But, but his approach does run into issues, like for instance, causality. Let's take, you know, he, one, of his, one of the reasons he's famous, uh, he's very famous is because of his analysis of causality. Still today, when you, when you write about causality, when you teach about causality, you gotta start with him. That's right. Now, the problem there is, of course, that he had a very good point up, up to a certain level of analysis, and then it sort of falters, at least in my, in my mind. Uh, because he was an empirical, so, so uh, Hume thinks that, that all our knowledge comes down to empirical evidence or empirical input of some sort or another, right? And, uh, and instead, it was Kant's great insight in, in his ability to reconcile essentially the rationalist and the empiricist tradition in philosophy. But I say, oh, wait a minute, there are other things out there. there you know, the, mind, the mind doesn't come as a tabula rasa, it, it comes with a certain number of innate uh, sort of. Uh, tendencies, ideas, tools, whatever you want to call them. Now, Kant, of course, wrote before Darwin. Today, we will argue probably that things like, you know, an intuitive conception of space, time, causality, and things like that are actually the result of, of evolution. That, you know, we come equipped with it because without it, we wouldn't be able to navigate the universe, you know, the world in which we actually live. But setting that aside, um, um, so the issue is, if, you, if you're interested in causality, you cannot just stop, as Hume did, to, uh, at the level of, uh, well, uh, it's a constant conjunction between events. There's one event and it's constantly conjunct conjuncted <laughs> with a second one. Therefore, you make the, 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 you know, you call that causality, but there's nothing else to be said about it. There's nothing else you can observe. Well, it's true. There's nothing else you can observe. But if you stopped at that, you would have no way, pretty much, to tell the difference between causal connections and, and simple correlations, spurious yeah. correlations. Yeah. We obviously do have, you know, we do make that distinction. It's fundamental in science. And it is fundamental, I would say, in everyday, uh, in everyday uh, analysis in this course. So that, you know, the treatment of causality, for instance, is one of those cases where I think that uh, Hume does run into uh, Hume's analysis is an approach to run into, run into, into uh, a problem. Another one is the treatment of uh, the self, of consciousness, right? So uh, he rejects basically the idea of a, um, of a stable self, of a sort of some kind of essence that just that, that determines self. And I agree. There is, I don't think there is anything, you know, the Aristotelian version of the self, whatever that was, I think it's gone. It's not, not tenable according to modern science. But then he goes further and he sort of almost espouses what what we will call today a Buddhist uh, position. Uh, basically, says you know, when I, whenever I looked inside, you know, and, and, the, and, and my own thought processes, all I see is this bundle uh, of perceptions. And so that uh, he says, you know, that's all the self is. You know, we, we look in, inwards and we see this fluid bundle of perception. Um, no, I don't think so. We see a lot more than that. Again, the reason for that is because we don't we don't start our lives as a tabula rasa. We don't just get in put from the outside and and then our mind is this blank slate over which the the, the, the experience basically writes um, we we have biases we select experience in a certain way we interpret experience in a certain way because we are a particular type yeah. of being that again evolved in a particular way I mean I don't want to go into evolutionary psychology because I don't think I don't think we have particularly good stories about this, the evolution of the self and of consciousness but we certainly do have uh, very good knowledge from modern neurobiology, let's say, that the brain is not a tabula rasa. The brain comes yeah, with yeah, 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 yeah. It's not deeply modular. It's not true that there is, you know, it doesn't work like a gadget. It doesn't have, you know, this little thing is for that, this little thing is for that. But it's also true that there is structure. And that structure develops largely, uh, or to, to a good extent, independently of environmental inputs. It, it's the result of a genetic program. So, um, so those, I think, are the limits of or some of the limits of Hume's analysis. Um, but at the same time, uh, oh, and I'm going to come up with a third one actually in a minute. Uh, if you don't mind, we're going to switch a gear for a second. But, um, but, but again, those are the kinds of things that made me think. You know, so when I read Hume about causality, or when I read Hume, so that one, the causality thing is really a very good example, because I read Hume's essay on causality. Uh, very early on. It was one of the first things that I did when I was still a practicing scientist. And my reaction to that was, this got to be wrong. 
Because if this is right, then science, a lot of science doesn't make any sense. That, you know, pretty much everything in science, except, except maybe fundamental physics, uh, causality is a fundamental concept. It needs, it needs to be there, and it has to be a little more robust than just, oh, we see this thing happening, and then we see this thing happening, and it's a psychological tendency that we have. So, so I do think that Hume is, has been great in, a great influence on me, not necessarily because I agree with a, a number of his philosophical positions, but because he really made me think very hard and very clearly, you know, as clearly as possible, uh, about a number, a huge number of, of, of issues. I mean, I can keep, keep, keep going and mentioning them. There is this, this, this treatment of morality, which is where I wanted to go next. Uh, there is, so, so is psychologi psychologists, essentially, a motivist uh, yeah. uh, uh, treat on, you know, approach to morality. Uh, there is this, uh, the, the, the problem of induction. I mean, come on, that's just, you know, any philosopher that had put one of those things on the map would be, uh, would deserve to be in the pantheon yeah. of all-time philosophers. And Hume has put a huge amount of those things. So that's why he's, uh, yeah. I think actually quite frankly, I, I still think he's grossly underestimated. Even though there has been a resurgence of Hume studies and there is a resurgence, been a resurgence of appreciation of Hume in the last several decades in philosophy, I still think he's far underappreciated to, you know, by comparison with what he actually did and what he actually wrote and how, far, how influential he was on philosophers immediately um, afterwards. But so, morality, right? So he famously said, uh, uh, you know, reason is and ought to be the slave of passions, right? And I completely reject that, that approach to morality. I think that... Well, he doesn't um, just well, say it, though. I mean, he does provide <laughs> a pretty substantial um, argument, right? I mean, he doesn't just say it. He does provide a pretty yeah, yeah. substantial argument but, for why but, reason yeah. couldn't play more of a role, right? Right. Because reason doesn't move anything. But I, that's yeah. Right. That's right. But I, I actually, no, 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 absolutely. I mean, what, again, one of the nice things about Hume is he doesn't just say stuff. Uh, you know, he provides a nice argument for it. Uh, I do think in that case, I'm not convinced by the argument. It's not just a reject the particular thing. But I, but I think he has a very important point. So first of all, again, it was revolutionary. Because yeah. up to that point, uh, you know, moral philosophers had basically been following Plato. Uh, you know, reason ought to be, is and ought to be in charge of, you know, of moral thinking and all that sort of stuff. So he basically turned things around dramatically, sort of 180 degrees. Yeah. And that was a huge, uh, you know, breath of fresh air. The reason I, I want to temper, I don't want to reject uh, Hume on that perspective, but I want to temper it, is because I think what he's telling us, actually, uh, he has an interesting essay, uh, interesting discussion that he had at the time with other uh, philosophers like Hutchison, uh, and, uh, and, and a number of others on, on human nature. This is one of his lesser known things, but, but he actually had some very perceptive, uh, perceptive things to say about human nature. And I think in his discussion with Hutchison uh, and Shaftesbury, uh, he actually got much closer to a nuanced view of human nature and therefore human morality, because I think that the two are essentially, you know, sort of almost coincident. Uh, what he says there is that, it, so one way to reinterpret what, he, what, Hume, what Hume was saying is like, look, we do inherit a certain, a large, you know, we have, because we are certain kind of biological beings, we have a certain way of, of you know, sort of an innate or instinctive, or whatever you want to call it, moral sense. It is true that passions, as in, you know, emotions and desires are the things that actually move us. You know, it, we were not being here doing this, you know, having these discussions if we didn't have a passion both for philosophy and for public understanding of philosophy, right? It's not like you can sit me down and say, oh, you really ought to have an interest in philosophy. Right. What are you talking about? I mean, in baseball, you know, right. I don't think so. Right. Right. So, so that is absolutely true. And, and it does need to be uh, sort of acknowledged. Um, what I want to resist, however, is uh, sort of going too far, running with that ball too far. First of all, in, in dismissing any role of reason, uh, in particular in terms of sort of, uh, uh, of ethical, ethical thinking. I mean, yes, we do have some innate and some, some sort of uh, automatic reaction to certain things. But then again, today, a lot of what it means to function in modern society is precisely that you don't think just with your guts. You, you sort of analyze 
uh, your first reaction. He said, you know, there's a number of examples in, in modern uh, moral psychology. Uh, for instance, when when you set, when you have people that have a sort of instinctive reactions to certain things uh, that, that they think are morally wrong, like you know, uh, uh, getting in, getting a, a flag of your country and then doing putting it down the toilet or something like that. Lots of people would say, "Oh, that's that's immoral." And then you start asking them for an argument for it. It's like, well, why? I mean, what, what's 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 wrong with that? It's just a piece of cloth. You know, you're not really attacking anybody. You're not making you're know, doing any harm or something. And most people actually start confabulating. They they just make up stuff. Uh, they don't they don't have a good reason for it. Um, now, what concerns me if one goes too is becomes too human about these kind of things is that then then we're going to simply accept that just because your passions are leading you in this yeah. direction or in that and then that's okay you know, yeah. that there's nothing else you can do I, I i disagree i think there's a lot you can do yeah. and in fact there's a lot you ought to do and also we know from modern again modern psychology psychological research that actually the brain does work uh, as a continuous feedback between sort of the emotional level and the reasoning level and so that you can actually change your you literally can change your emotional responses uh if you actually work on certain things uh one of the best examples is this, this, this research that shows recently that we're all pretty much racists, meaning that uh, you can test people under conditions where they're not overtly thinking about racism and they react, you know, like you present them with a number of pictures of different kinds of people and you measure their sort of unconscious reactions and you will see that, you know, most people actually do react differently when they're presented with pictures or situations that are about uh, members of a different race, right, or, yeah. or ethnic background. Yes, that's true. So that would seem to seem to show, and I completely believe it, that we have sort of some 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 instinctive level of what we we call racism, and I would call it xenophobia, which is probably a re again a result of evolution, because you know it's it's hard to imagine that uh, there was no adaptive advantage in being wary of anybody that looked differently from you uh, coming so all of a sudden coming into your tribe. So that's fine, true, but doesn't mean that we are all racists. I don't think so, because then it, you, to me, being racist means actually giving assent, as Epictetus would say, to that first reaction. Okay, so fine, I react in a certain way when I see, you know, a black person or, or, a, or a person of a different, you know, uh, ethnic background or whatever. But then I stop myself, and then I say, wait, that's that's not right. Um, I'm not going to treat that person differently from anybody else because because it is not right. So to me, that is reason overriding an emotional instinct yeah. uh, as it ought to be, as yeah. it really ought to be. Yeah, I, I mean, well, it's, it's, it's in, one of the things that struck me as interesting, I, I almost, almost was going to laugh, is that, you know, um, you chose Hume as, the, as your philosopher talking about who influenced you, and as we're talking, I'm actually thinking that I probably accept more of Hume's philosophy than you do, um, uh, which is <laughs> sort of funny. Um, 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 I guess I could have easily chosen them also. Um, you know, what you were just saying about, you know, the relationship of reasons to sentiments, you know, I mean, I think is exactly right. And I think, I think, but, but at the, on the other hand, I mean, I think part of what Hume, the reason why Hume, I think a lot of times Hume winds up in the positions he is because he really does follow the arguments where he thinks they go. And I think that one of the things here is that, that he can't get past is the, is the notion that reason cannot determine our ends right right that, that, that reason and and here's the problem to say that reason can determine our ends is indeed to grant reason a tremendous amount of power to in a sense metaphysically speculate right it's it's grants reason a tremendous i mean aristotle also didn't think that reason could determine our ends um um, um and he also didn't think that reason ultimately could tell us what was right or wrong ultimately um, it can only tell us that what's right or wrong is always within a certain range, right? But to actually determine what's right or wrong for Aristotle was a matter of perception, ultimately. Um, to be able to see, sort of like being able to tell whether bread is properly baked or not, ultimately requires perception. So I think that Hume, in a sense, felt himself partly forced into this position by a number of consideration. One, that reason cannot determine our ends. Um, it's not substantive in that way. It's a calculative faculty, right? Um, 
furthermore, that um, reason also can't move us, like you just said, right? You have to care in order to do something. It's not enough to be shown that something is obligatory. You have to care about it. So I think that in a sense right. that he takes a position because of these considerations sort of force him. He said, well, this is the only domain, this is the only le position that I can, that I can, that I can wind up with. Um, um, so, so. That's, that all of that is true. The, the problem is, uh, and, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you does follow his reasoning uh, where he, wherever it leads him, which is one of the nice things about him, one of the, the really good things about, about him. He's not afraid to go wherever he thinks is reasonable to go. Um, that said, however, I think actually in some sense that he thought had a better understanding of human psychology than, than Hume may, may have had. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it's, less mechanistic, was, it's less mechanistic, that's why. Hume's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right, exactly. And also, uh, Hume basically ended up setting up a, too much of a dichotomy uh, between reason and emotion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and what we, today we know from studies in neurobiology from people like Antonio Anton Damasio and, 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 and so on and so forth, is that actually the two do interact in a very dynamic, very nonlinear, very complex way. Yeah. So it is true that reason by itself cannot compel you to do anything. And if you see reason as completely detached from the emotion, yeah, then yeah. it becomes entirely instrumental. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it is and true, as Aristotle had intuited before modern, modern psychology came about, that you can sort of think about certain stuff and then decide that it's right or not right, and then nudge your, your way by habit, essentially, by yes. modifying your habit, right? Yes. Uh, that, that was the basis of, of Aristotle's, you know, virtual ethics and moral and, and sort of moral improvement. He thought that moral improvement was made possible precisely by the fact that you sort of build and redirect and, and by habit certain things. And today we know, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy works that way. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So, so you do have a, an interaction between cognition, you know, sort of high level rational functioning and emotional emotional functioning. So that means that that human A very good point where uh, so it was trying to sort of be uh, what was accepted in philosophy years, uh, but at the same time, I think again it went a little too far uh, for my own comfort uh, zone, but especially more importantly for in, in terms of sort of modern evidence from uh, cognitive science and also sort of from from philosophy that followed you. Again, that doesn't detract anything from you because we don't expect thinkers that are, you know, two or three hundred years old to get everything right. I mean, that yeah. that would be just weird, right? Yeah. Uh, and and if we can still use uh, Hume, just like we can use Aristotle, you know, more than two millennia after he, he, he wrote what yeah. he wrote, that is a testament to the to the importance of their ideas and to the fecundity yeah. of their ideas, even though. A bunch of the, you know many aspects of those ideas now we reject as, as as wrong. They still provide us with a starting point. Yeah, this is um you know this is probably the third or fourth time this has come up, and I really think that we need to do something on a, a video on the ways in which modern philosophy imp improved upon ancient philosophy and in the ways in which it actually did not, right? Because I think right. what I'm seeing here again is something that I think you and I have gone through several times on different subjects. What happens is, you know, if, Hume's, the, if Hume is making the mistakes you're saying, I think that that's largely because of notions that are ubiquitous in the Enlightenment, right? In, in, other, in other words, his yeah. notion of reason is much smaller and narrower and purely instrumental than the Greek one. But that's a product more generally of the Enlightenment and of the scientific revolution, right? His notion of causality is much narrower and thinner than the one in the ancient Greece, again, because right. of modern physics, because of the idea of sufficient reason, an, an antecedent event sufficient for a subsequent event, right? Um, um, yeah, let's not he, forget the creature in this time, right? You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Let's not forget the book Hume, uh, well, Hume and, and Kant lived during the Enlightenment. That's right. Uh, Kant wrote his famous short essay on you know, what is Enlightenment. Not only that, but they both um, very consciously said, out to reorganize, to reestablish philosophy by following natural philosophy, by following Newton. So That's you're right. absolutely right. There is there's a lot there that has, that results of the enlightenment and the, the rise of science, uh, which in my estimate actually does not constitute pro, uh, uh, you know moving in the right direction. It may constitute progress for philosophy in the general sense that 
these people were exploring new ways of doing philosophy, different ways of doing philosophy from the ancients. Yeah. In that sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. does progress. But whether the outcome is actually better or not, actually, I think there is significant amount of doubt. And in fact, I would reject that. Yeah, that no, I think that's right. I think the main benefit of the scientific revolution on philosophy was to finally put to bed any notion that there should be a role of authority in justification, right? right? But its specific influence, modern physics specific influence on philosophy, I don't think has been all that good at all. Because what it, one of the things it's done is it's caused philosophy to narrow a lot, a number of key notions that when yeah. used in philosophy really should be broader. I mean, when yes. we're talking about me Newtonian mechanics, yes, what we mean by a cause is a very thin thing, right? But when yeah. we're talking more generally and philosophically, what we mean by a cause is a much broader thing. And it really, it distorts things to, to mimic the science too much in that way, right? Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, do you think that we should move to Danto? Yes, because yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just occurred to me that we could spend the whole time well, talking about you. Behind my back on my on my lap there. Is that Aristotle? Who is that? Aristotle. Yes. Aristotle. Yeah. And I'm, I'm I'm covering the card. There it is. There are. That's <laughs> that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, okay. So so, that, so I chose. So the, the, you know, I saw him. Uh, I saw him here at the Garrett Center just a year or two before he died. He, yeah. He, well, he gave me one of his last seminars. Yeah. Oh, he taught. It? Did he actually teach at the Graduate yeah. Center? I didn't teach, but he he, he came he came and, and gave a colloquium. Yeah, uh, at the here at the Garden Center. Yeah, he was of course a professor at Columbia for a long time, and um, right. um, was also uh, an art critic for the Nation, for the magazine The Nation. Um, yeah. um, so, I, why did I pick Danto? So, um, there's a there's a general reason, then a specific reason. So, the general reason is so, as you know, I was my most of my schooling was in the philosophy of language. I was trained in the philosophy of language, and. Um, it was when I got to the point of the dissertation that I realized that I was going to have a problem. And the problem was twofold. Philosophy of language was a very large pond, a very large pond. And back when I was in graduate school in the 90s, it was a really large pond. I mean, now there's some areas that are rivaling it. But back in the 90s, philosophy of language was the top. I mean, all the top thinkers were working in that area. And so there was a, a you know, so much high level material that I didn't see it, that I could contribute anything that would be noticeable in such an environment. And furthermore, philosophy of language requires a level of sophistication in logic um, that I simply don't have and never will have. Uh, I simply am not tuned that way. I come to philosophy from the humanities, not from sciences or from mathematics. And, and so there was this, I realized I was limited. It was a very good education, philosophy of language. And I, I, do, I still think it was a very good education to have but it wasn't something that I felt I could do productive research in. And so I switched over to aesthetics. And once I started learning some aesthetics, I quickly came to the opinion that Danto was simply the best of it. That if, if any of the theories that were floating around were going to be right, it was going to be his. That he was by far the most sophisticated um, and by far um, uh, the most... Um, um, it wasn't just that he was most, most sophisticated philosophically, but he knew the art history and the art criticism better than anybody else. A lot of the people working in aesthetics, I get the sense, actually don't really know anything about art at all, right? Which is, which yeah. is a problem, which is really a problem. Yeah. Um, so and, in, yeah. in a few words, what is his theory of Okay, so I'm, I, I, I will say that. So it's impossible to sort of explain his significance without doing a tiny bit of background. And that is, you really can divide theories of art. So we're talking now about what the definition of art is, right? What, what, can, can this term be defined? Is there an essence to art? Is there something that all right. artworks have in common? Are there necessary and sufficient conditions? That's the question, one of the dominant questions. It's not the only question, it says it's one of the dominant questions. And we really can divide all the theories about that into two types. There's the pre-Wittgenstein type and the post-Wittgenstein type. And, um, what, and this actually happens chronologically. So, you know, from the Enlightenment, you have a theory that define, you have the theories that try to define art in terms of representation. You have theories that try to de define art in terms of beauty. You have theories that try to define art in terms of expression. You have theories that try to define art in terms of formal properties, all in a ring, one after the other. And what happens is each theory, in a sense, becomes dated because art history evol evolves past it. Right? So art history gets to the point where artists are making things that no longer fall under the definitions that are prevalent. 
And so then there's a, a moment of crisis. There's some people who want to say it isn't art. Then there's other people who want to change the definition. Eventually, the definition gets changed, right? Now, you do this for a few hundred years, and you start to wonder whether maybe there's something wrong with the project, not, not with the theories, but with the project. And then a development comes along in art history that really makes this pressing, and that's the emergence of what they call the ready-mades. So Duchamp's right. urinal, which was called Fountain, he took a urinal off of its fixtures and stuck it in a, submitted it to a sculpture exhibition. Right. Um, uh, there's, there's also, he has a snow shovel, um, Robert, Robert Rauschenberg, the Project Expressionist, his, he submitted his bed as, a, as, a, as an artwork. It's hanging in the MoMA, sticking out of the wall of the MoMA. Um, and then later Warhol with his Brillo boxes, which are not literally ready-mades because he actually made them himself, but they're indistinguishable from an actual Brillo box. Right. And the problem that, these, that this development posed was that at this point, what it shows is that anything could in principle be art, right? Anything in principle could be art. And also, anything could be a property of an artwork, right? Now, once you get to that point, it looks like a definition is impossible, right? Because if anything can be an artwork and anything can be a property of an artwork, then any definition of art is going to have indefinitely long lists of characteristics, right? right? So, you, so, so, so it made it look like you just couldn't define art at all. At around the same time that this is happening, of course, Wittgenstein is, is, is arguing that you can't define most words, right? Most words, you can't give lists of necessary and sufficient conditions. And so this leads to a period of anti-theory, right? Where right. you have a bunch of estheticians, people like Morris Weitz and William Kennick, who are basically saying art can't be defined. All you can give is family resemblances. The word art is just like the word game, right? So I can say things that, you know, artworks have in common, other things they don't have in common, the way you determine whether something is art, just like whether you determine something is, game, is a game, is whether or not it suitably resembles the things that are already accepted, right? That's, 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 yeah. that's how you go about it. So this went on for a few decades, no anti-theorists. And then someone had a very interesting idea and they said, wait a minute, all the efforts to define art thus far have been in terms of observable or manifest properties. But what right. if we try to define art in terms of non-observable properties, let's say relational properties. So for example, the word prime minister is perfectly definable, but you couldn't define a prime minister in terms of observable characteristics. I mean, there are fat prime ministers, there are short prime ministers, there are bald prime ministers, there are black sure. prime ministers, etc. You define prime minister in terms of a series of relations to a set of institutions and practices, right? And so the idea was, well, maybe we can define art this way. Maybe rather than define art in terms of some manifest features that you are observable in artworks, we can define art in terms of some relationship either to a practice or to an institution or to and so on and so forth. So this then gave new life to the, to, to the project of defining art and produced what I've been calling in my own work and in, in published work, the new, a new wave of British, of, of aesthetic theories, of which Dantos I think is the best. Now the most famous, the most well-known example of this type of theory is the institutional theory of art, which is associated with the philosopher George Dickey, which basically says art is a kind of status. So what makes something uh -huh. an artwork is that the right institutions say it's an artwork, right? Um, like the like moment. Right, like the MoMA, right. The problem with this is that it works really well for contemporary art. It, re it works really well for art within the right. period when there is a discernible art world. It's That's not right. going to work for medieval paintings. It's not no, going right. right. to where there's no art world in the sense that's meant, right? Or, or for prehistoric cave paintings. That's right. It's not going to work for any of that, right? And so yeah. that theory really doesn't, doesn't have much, much uh, going for it. But Danto's theory, now Danto's theory uh, has a lot of legs. And, that, and, and what Danto's theory essentially is, is that um, artworks are essentially a certain kind of interpretable ar artifact. Right? So an artwork okay. is something that is subject to certain kinds of interpretation. Putting it in the opposite direction, artworks are things with, which mean things in certain ways. Right? So, of course, he needs to distinguish art from ordinary speech, from street signs, from things like that. Those all mean things in a, in, in a very straightforward way. 
artworks are, are things that mean things in a more elliptical kind of way, right? In a way that's related to metaphor, in a way, that, in other words, when we use metaphor, we use language in a way that's somewhat artistic. Um, and yeah. what he thinks artworks are, are things that mean in that way. Um, and, uh, and, and I thought at the time that this was the best theory going. I wrote my dissertation largely assuming it. Um, and it fueled a good part of the early part of my career until I started to turn against it. And I spent the last part of my career refuting Danto. <laughs> so All right. it's one of these things where I thought he's- Wait, you, you almost convinced me there. Now <laughs> you're gonna refute it? Fine, go ahead. Yeah, so, so but, but you know, the, the point isn't, isn't to go into too deep into Danto exegesis, but more to say, so the reason I, the reason I chose Danto is A, um, he was the most important to me when I was changing over to aesthetics from philosophy of language. He was by far what I thought the most sophisticated uh, philosophically, and he knew the most about the art, the art history. He really had credibility on the art history. Um, and um, I thought his theory was the best of this new crop of theories, all of which came after the developments mid-century uh, when we went through not just the, when the ready-mades were coming out and the pop art was coming out, but also when theorists were saying, well, we can't define art, we're going to do this the way Wittgenstein says we should in terms of family resemblances. Um, I thought his was the best of those post-crisis theories. And, um, and that's, that's why you know, he had tremendous influence on my work. Um, and since most of my work has been in aesthetics, um, uh, about 70% of my work has been in aesthetics. He's been the biggest influence. Okay. Me. But now the obvious answer is, so what do you think you got wrong? Well, so the obvious <laughs> question. Not the so this is, this answer. is, you know, the, it's, this is something that's challenging to sort of, because what he got wrong, I think is very, so Danto's theory really rests upon these these what he calls twin cases so what the ready-mades do is they give you a kind of a twin a twin problem right an indiscernibles problem so here we have fountain and here we have a urinal right, right? and the right. urinal and fountain are indistinguishable visibly you can't tell them apart visibly that's not what differentiates them and yet one is an artwork and one isn't right so right. Danto's theory rests on the idea that it's possible to have two things, one of which is an artwork and one of which isn't, which are perceptually indistinguishable from one another, that therefore the difference between them must be something that's not perceptually indistinguishable. And what he says the difference is, is that one means something and the other doesn't, right? The urinal that's in, the, that's in your bathroom doesn't mean anything. Duchamp's urinal does mean something and it means something in a very particular way in this rhetorical, metaphorical, elliptical sort of way. But I then started realizing that if you look back at the history of art, you can find objects that are almost a counterexamples to Danto. So Danto's trading on the idea that we can have perceptual indiscernibility um, and yet differences in meaning, right? And what I wanted to say was that, right. well, you know, if you go and look at older paintings, right, you look at stuff, especially, let's say, from the Renaissance, um, right. You can have paintings that pretty much mean exactly the same thing, and yet they're different artworks. See, for Dante, if Dante's theory is true, if two works mean the same thing, they're the same painting, right? The, 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 prin the principle of individuation is meaning. The problem right. is, if you look at 10 Flemish Renaissance paintings of the crucifixion, they all yep. mean the yep. same thing. Same. The, the interpretation right. is conventional. They're basically accumulations of symbols and tropes, okay? That's right. But they're not the same painting. They're not the same artworks. They're different artworks. In that case, yep. what individuates them is their physical discernibility, right? The Bruegel looks a little different from the from the Petrus Christus, which looks a little different from. I mean, they're basically the same paint. They're, they mean the same thing, right? But they're not the same work. And so I thought that that was a straightforward counterexample. That that what that Danto argues that artworks are individuated by their interpretations. That what makes this one this one and that one that one is that this one means this and that one means that. And what I wanted to show is that you can find paintings yeah. where they both mean the same thing and yet they're still different artworks. And to me, that's a straightforward counterexample. Really, the problem with Danto's theory is that it really only applies 
to art after a certain time and to art in which what the artist is doing by way of the art is expressing an individual personal inspiration. And that simply doesn't cap, cap, cap that does not capture art up until the up until a certain point. Art right. was much more I, yeah. I would say a pretty late point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it, yeah. it suffers some of the same problems as the institutional theory. It really right. only works for art after a certain time. When right. the art was much more individualistic, when the artists were celebrities and they had an individual vision and that individual vision gets put in the work. But back in right. the Middle Ages, they were working in workshops. They were so, being commissioned. They were being, you know, it, it was a totally different sort of thing. So yeah. Sure. So this reminds me of two, uh, two theories of art that I put forward. Uh, let's call it the Pellucci theory of art A and the Pellucci theory of art B. And these are in fact in jest, but only halfway in jest. Right. Because I actually agree with your analysis. And, and so one possibility, I think, is that a lot of modern, not all of it by, by any stretch, but a lot of modern sort of contemporary art uh, started out as a prank. Started out by thing, people like Duchamp, especially Duchamp. Maybe Duchamp was explicitly a prank. Yeah, it was explicitly a prank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then people thought, oh my gosh, it's a great idea. Let's run with it. Uh, and, and I mean, that was a mistake. Running with it was a mistake. It was a great idea, but then running with it was a mistake. So that's theory number one. Which And so what that does is it makes, in fact, a lot of the post Duchamp stuff very anomalous in within the context of the, of the history of art, of art from, you know, prehistoric times until now. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, uh, the, other, the other way in which I often, unfortunately, think about, about contemporary art, and I have to say this, uh, you might get from these remarks that I don't particularly appreciate a lot of contemporary art. I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I stopped at the early part of the 20th century, by and large, with a few exceptions. Um, but I do try, I do force myself, for instance, at least once a year to go to the new museum here in New York, which is all about contemporary uh, art and, and about performance art and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I do try, um, you know, I, I go to, the, to, to the, this nice uh, place outside of upstate New York and on the Hudson River, the DIA um, uh, Center, which has really incredible uh, you know, modern sculpture. So it's, it's not like I'm not trying. Uh, in some sense, it relates to uh, to the way in which I think philosophy makes progress, which we talked about the last three times, uh, the last three videos. So if philosophy makes progress in, in uh, as you know, in, uh, in, in terms of, in my mind, in terms of exploring uh, sort of certain landscape of possibilities, right, of conceptual possibilities. I think a case, and we, we've talked about this, I think a case can be made that art also works in a similar way, not quite identical, because art is a different kind of enterprise from philosophy, of course. Yeah. But uh, we came up with the idea, for, I proposed, for instance, the, this, the, the idea that, that the history of jazz is illustrative of this uh, trend, trend in the arts, right? That, that jazz started out as a particular kind of, of uh, musical composition and performance that, of course, has its own roots in, you know, in previous types of music. It evolved into different styles throughout the 20th century, and at some point, arguably, ran out yeah. of new ideas. It ran out of conceptual space. It sort of explored pretty much everything that was ex to be explored without turning into something completely different. Because you know, then you can say, well, then you can make a jump into something completely different, but it's no longer jazz, or it's no longer recognized right. as jazz, right? right? And at that point, what it started to do was a combination of other things. So revisiting previous styles and sort of mixing them up and that sort of stuff. I think to some extent, one could argue, and I'm absolutely not an a, a art critic or an esthetician or anything like that, but um, one could argue that actually contemporary art has gone in, in a similar rut, essentially. That, uh, you know, we're looking at thousands of years of art and artistic production and different styles and different subject matters and so on and so forth. And it's a meet different meanings. And at some point, it must have been that you either started doing something that other people had done before, in which case you were not innovative, or the way to go innovative was to do these kinds of things like, it, like the ready-made, for yeah. one thing, or my favorite examples, you know, 
uh, white canvas number 34, white yeah. canvas number five, and so on and so forth, right? Those are logical possibilities. Those I can imagine that one could say, you know what, there's been Michelangelo, there's been Raphael, there's been, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of other, you know, the modern paintings and all that. At this point, what's left for me to do and still make a mark? Right. Oh, let me do nothing in the case of, you know, uh, or close to nothing in the case of a sort of an empty canvas. Or let me do, let me take an object from every day and call it art and see what yeah. happens. So there is a possibility, I'm only half facetious about this. There's a possibility actually that, that one of the reasons modern art historians and, and philosophers of art have so much trouble in sort of coming up with reasonable theories of art is because actually late 20th century and early 21st century art is very anomalous in yeah. itself. And it's gone off into very, very different directions that maybe we should start using a different term for it. Yeah. That maybe it's not art it, as it has been conceived for the previous several thousand years. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a very general issue here that I, that I always wind up talking to my students a lot about, and that is that definitions play both descriptive and prescriptive roles. And the really? juggling of when they should be used prescriptively and when they should be is very difficult and probably admits of no principled answer. Because, yeah. look, I mean, uh, there is a certain futility to simply applying it prescriptively when the, the sort of the history is still carrying on anyway, right? I mean, you know, you could say that right. something is an art, right. <laughs> but if the critics are talking about it, if it's art, and if the museums are displaying it, and if the audience is there's a certain futility to trying to impose the definition prescriptively. On the other sure. hand, there's also a certain pointlessness to only using them descriptively. I mean, you know, they, they do function in a somewhat of a prescriptive fashion. But what you were saying, actually, though, there is another element of Dante's philosophy that speaks to this. And so if you would ask me what are the two most famous or well-known elements of Dante's philosophy, one would be his theory of art, which I laid out. But the other is his theory of art history. And he actually, ah. claimed, he actually claims that art history came to an end, right? And that we're now in a post-historical period, right? And Thanks. the idea is that, um, look, art for most of its history, up until a certain point, was outwardly directed in the sense that what it was about and what it was trying to do were things that were not themselves artistic. In other words, for much of your, the history of European art, Art is part is in the service of theology, right? It's a way yeah. of expressing theological ideas and right. a way of reflecting changes in theological ideas. So if you look at early medieval art and you look at late medieval art, you can clearly see right. that the burgeoning humanism in Christian theology is being played right. out in the paintings, right? That the paintings are becoming right. more and more humanistic because they're expressing right. the, new, the new ideas that are on the scene theologically. Right. So from what Actually, you, yeah, go on. You could probably send that back even further to the Greek Roman art because you know they didn't have a theology as we understand it right. in the Christian sense, but they certainly did have a state sort of uh, That's uh, right. I don't know what you what do you want to call it, but a state kind of power ideology for yeah. sure. Yeah. And they also had of course a, a, a mythology and a lot of the art even in the Greek Roman world has it was was done either in terms of the, you know, in, in, as a function of the, of the mythology right. or as a function of the state ideology. So, yeah, absolutely. And it expresses the change in, 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 um, in sort of collective personality. I mean, there's a reason why the Hellenistic right. art is so wild and right. the, the classical art is so, sto is so staid, right? Because the culture was more tumultuous in the Hellenistic period. The philosophies were wilder in the Hellenistic period and more extreme in the Hellenistic period than they were in the early generations. So in any way, art, art for most of its history was outwardly directed in this way. And then yeah. it got to a point at which art began to start meditating and reflecting more upon itself. What does it do, right? And a, a lot of things, caused this to happen. One, one thing that caused this to happen, for example, is the, the emergence of photography. So once you develop photography, you no longer need painters to produce likenesses, right? You have a machine that can produce likenesses. So one of the things that that does is it starts getting painters thinking, well, what is it that we distinctively do, right? What is it that we distinctively do as opposed to uh, a photographer? All up until now, we've been making likenesses. Right. But now something else can make likenesses, and now that causes me to soul search, right? 
So art became, in a sense, self-conscious. It started to think about what it is that it essentially does, right? And that begins what Dante calls a history of erasures, that art begins to erase elements from itself that are not essential to what it is, but are peripheral to what it is, and that can be done by, other, by others. That's why you get art painting as pure gesture, or painting as pure texture, or lack of texture, or monochrome, right. or whatever, because in a sense, it's an attempt to reduce or distill, right? And what Danda says is that the ultimate distillation is in the ready-mades and the Brillo boxes, right? Because at the end of the day, what the artist is, is he's promoting an idea through an artifact. That's what he's doing, right? At the right. bare minimum. Now, once you get to that point, you're at the end. There's nowhere else to go. In your yeah. language, you've exhausted the conceptual space. That's so right. now what happens, endless recombination, remixing, retro, right? So in the 70s, you get photorealism, which is like a right. throwback, right? Um, yeah. and, 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 and that's what sort of, so, so you're now in a post-historical period, according to Danto. Now, you know, it's a very interesting idea. I think it's plausible. Now, in his case, it's also motivated by a Hegelian. I mean, he is a kind of a Hegelian. He really does think that there is an inevitability right. to this kind of arc, which right. I probably wouldn't go with. But I think the Hegelianism is dispensable. Um, yeah. um, a mere reflection on the art history, I think, bears out, bears this out. I think it is. I mean, I don't, I'm certainly not a Hegelian myself, but I think that one can still maintain that there was that it was, quote unquote, inevitable that we would get to this point simply because if the space of conceptual possibilities is limited and we yeah. start exploring it, that's eventually right. we're <coughs> going to get to the end of it. That's right. You know, that's right. One way or another, we're going to get to the end. And it's also inevitable that the more different modes of expression that there are, the more likely it is that any individual mode is going to become more self-conscious about what it does, right? Um, because it's sure. now in competition. Um, sure. and it has to reflect upon what it does distinctively from everything else. Um, and so I agree that there's a kind of inevitability to it, but I want to be careful. I, I'm very, I'm very leery usually of inevitability theses, especially yeah. as applied yeah. to history. I do think in history though, that once a certain number of forces are in place, things do become somewhat predictable in a way. Um, um, but, um, but that's about all I'd be willing to say about it. Um, I do like modern art better than you. I mean, I don't know if you if you just don't like the postmodern, but I mean, do you like modern art, like modern European abstraction, like Kandinsky or Malevich or you know oh, yeah. stuff from the early twentieth century, yeah. mid twentieth yeah. century? Yeah, yeah. It's really the postmodern yeah, that that's I think. That's why I said. Yeah, that's right. That's why I said early twentieth twentieth century. When we get to postmodern and some kind of performative, you know, what you call it, then it's like now that doesn't do much for me. That's right. So well, but, we managed to fit both Hume and Danto into a conversation, which is uh, I know I mean. Right. Quite, quite a challenge. Um, I, I do think, I think I'm going to email you. I think we should do something on ancient and modern. I really do. Because this has now come up a half dozen times. Yeah. And sure. um, I think everybody assumed, or a lot of people assume, that progress is pretty straightforward. Right. Regardless of how you define it, that right. it's pretty straightforward. And I don't think it is. I mean, I think it's more like a, you know, five steps forward, but then three steps back. Right. Um, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh, well, because because again, you might have different criteria for what counts as progress, right? So on, on the one hand, if by progress you just mean, uh, well, you know, people are, are exploring possibilities that were not explored before, okay, fine. Um, but but if you mean by, like, by it something like, let's talk about art for a second, like, oh, the aesthetic pleasure that I get out of, observe, you know, looking at a painting, well, I'm sorry for contemporary art, but I get a hell of a lot more from Michelangelo right. than from White Canvas number 34, yeah. even though White Canvas number 34 is a kind of progress uh, in, in art because it has never been done before. Right. So, right. yeah. Right. Like, and if, something like that can be said for philosophy. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree with that. Well, thank you so much, Massimo. Uh, this, was, this was a lot of fun. And I like the fact that this is something we can always go back to because um, each of us probably has a whole roster of people yeah. <laughs> that have really mattered to mattered to us and to our work. Um, um, you know, both times you've spoken about someone who's really influenced you at a personal level and also at a sort of um, uh, a level of sort of basic motivation and orientation. I would at some point be interested in hearing what the really substantial influences have been, the people whose, whose theories you really have agreed with, right? That, that'd be interesting to me um, to hear.
uh, as well. So yeah, <laughs> all right. Yeah, you look like you're thinking. You're pondering Sounds that. good. You're like I don't agree with anybody. That's what you're thinking, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like. I'm scratching my head. I'm like, what? Who no, I'm the... <laughs> All right, Massimo. Well, take care. I hope you're having a good semester. Continue to have thank a good semester. Too. And we'll talk again soon. Absolutely. All right. Thank you.